Thank you, and uh, thank you all for inviting us. Uh, I'm Mari Yurich, I'm faculty at the University of Washington, and I'm the coordinator <coughs> of Ruben Solar System Processing Group. So this is a slightly different mission relative to the other four we've heard about. We are a telescope on the ground, but it will still do a lot of exploration of the solar system from our vantage point in Chile. So the the uh, Vera Rubin Observatory is uh, going to consist of an 8.4 meter optical survey telescope on Cerro Pachon in Chile. Um, it's powered by a 3.2 gigapixel camera with very fast readout. So in our uh, standard mode, we can take an image of the sky and read it out um, every 40 seconds. Um, site construction has been going on for a while now, um, began in April 2015. And we expect it to finish, and I'll talk about that in detail in, in, in just a bit, in, uh, uh, in the next two and a half years, starting the survey in late uh, 2023. Um, the products of the survey should be um, really, really good uh, relative to both the, the, the size, um, the volume of the data delivered, and the precision. So we're expecting systematic photometry on the order of half percent to a percent. Um, systematic astrometry uh, down to 10 milliarc seconds uh, relative 50 milliarc seconds absolute and very precise timekeeping. So this all makes it possible to both discover, link, and um, track asteroids. Just to convince you that uh, this is a, a, a real um, piece of, of, uh, of equipment, this is the building uh, just a couple of, from a couple of days ago. Uh, the dome is the last piece that is being fitted and that should complete um, in a few months. Um, the telescope has been, um, all of the, the entire mount has been um, uh, manufactured, assembled, tested at the manufacturer, um, packaged and shipped to Chile. It's uh, awaiting completion of the dome to be installed. And the camera, uh, which is a quite sizable piece of equipment, it's a 3.2 megapixel, uh, 3.2 gigapixel camera, has also been tested in the lab. Um, and there's a really nice image viewer if you if you click on uh, this link ls.st slash 9nt that allows you to see the first one of the first test images and zoom in and zoom out and get a feel for what uh, each individual field of view is going to look like. It's, uh, it's quite impressive. So the LSST is a somewhat different mission relative to our, our typical um, solar system exploration missions in, in so much that it's a multi-mission observatory. So the idea here is really to continuously image the sky, collect the data, place them in the database, and then enable a whole slew of different investigations. And four uh, topics that were specifically called out in the LSST proposals um, dating back 20 years ago were dark matter, dark energy, Milky Way structure formation, exploring the transient sky, and clearly of interest to us cataloging the solar system. So all of this, is going to occur through one single survey that's designed to support uh, all four science themes. So in any given night, um, the Rubin Observatory is going to cover um, about 5,000 square degrees twice, and the cadence has been chosen so as to enable the discovery and follow-up and cell follow-up of, uh, of solar system bodies. Um, there will be some, a couple of smaller surveys at a 10% level to explore um, extreme corners of discovery space, um, things such as uh, taking really, really dense light curves um, in, in certain regions going very, very deep. Those also have uh, great potential for solar system science. In terms of solar system science, um, I think this is our, our, uh, our observation slash processing loop that's uh, of importance. So every night, the observatory will observe in a uh, rather automated mode, collecting data on you know, roughly 5,000 square degrees or so, including the ecliptic. Um, as you may have seen in the previous slide, this, um, this here is the ecliptic, and, and this patch up here has specifically been added to enable uh, solar system object, or to enhance solar system object discoveries. Um, in the morning, we collect all the data in a window uh, of, in a trailing window of about uh, 14, 14 nights and perform track of construction and linking, make discoveries, and then submit them to the Minor Planet Center. The Minor Planet Center um, immediately processes those data uh, in, definitely in time for the, the next night of observing when, um, again, any objects that are recovered um, get uh, um, immediately Associated with known objects from the minor, with 
previous discoveries, no objects from minor planet center, go back up here and this loop continues. So the bottom line here is that anything LSST or Rubin Observatory observes uh, in any given night, in less than 24 hours, it is at the minor planet center and available to the, to the broad community for, uh, for exploration and for analysis. So one of the challenging things here has actually been that connection to the minor planet center and just making sure that we are able to deliver all the data and the minor planet center is able to ingest them. So the best way to test that is to actually do a, a little bit of a drill and a test rehearsal and we've done that, um, I believe it was October or November, so a couple of months ago. Um, it was quite successful and it also struck us um, it's you know, one thing to talk about these things in paper, the other thing is actually see the data flow, even if they're simulated. Uh, to give you a sense for what to expect, a typical early night in, in LSST will bring 17,000 new um, small body discoveries every night. So it clearly it varies depending on whether the, the uh, observatory is looking at the ecliptic or slightly away, but these are new discoveries and these are just NDAs because they dominate the sample, but this is the kind of thing to expect. And there's an interesting technical problem that we discovered, which is that um, the, if you think about the, the naming of asteroids, uh, 2020 AB22, that 22, that cycle number in PAC designation format, there's room for only 16,000 of them in any two week period. And we expect to deliver about 17,000 every night. So this is a very good problem to solve. And that's one of the things that um, uh, we'll be uh, working on with the community for the next two years. So first light um, has been scheduled for this year and operations were to start in October, 2022. We have been impacted by COVID. Chile has been in the lockdown and then a partial shutdown for a while. Um, our crews couldn't get up to the mountain. So everything is essentially slipping day by day as, as this crisis continues. And right now well, the, the crews are back on the mountain. The, the uh, construction is continuing, but we have had an impact. It's about a year delay. So we have an estimate right now, assuming that nothing um, bad, nothing worse happens uh, between now and the fall, um, that things will be shifted by a year and we'll start in October, 2023. That's still two and a half years from now. Let me talk a little bit about what to expect uh, from the point of view of science. I think, I think of LSST as both a discovery and characterization machine. So let's talk about discoveries first. And now that I stare at the slide, I, I just realized that I took the, a, an, an old version uh, because these numbers are slightly higher now. So the, the number of known male Beth asteroids is an order of a million and the number of uh, known uh, TNOs is about 4,000. But you kind of get the feel for, uh, for what I think we'll be able to contribute. So typically the, the number of discoveries is going to go up by factors of five to 40. So um, factor of five in main belt asteroids, uh, 35 to 40 Jupiter choices and so forth. Um, and the interesting um, element of this is that for most of these populations, LSST is a 10 year mission, but for most of these populations, we're actually going to get the bulk of the discoveries in the first uh, one to three years. Um, and that's simply the time that it takes for the earth to make um, one uh, circle around the sun and for us to scan the asteroid belt and uh, the, the TNO belt. Um, the exceptions here are some subpopulations such as of NEOs that are in, in um, um, uh, uh, they're almost orbiting with the Earth or res resonant orbit that, that appear um, um, only for a brief period of time, um, appear visible only for a brief period of time before leaving, and interstellar objects that, uh, that, that come um, and, and go um, with a roughly regular flux. Rubin, once it's on the sky, will um, drive the NEO discovery rates. Uh, we expect to see about 50 to 100,000 um, NEOs, depending on which model you assume is, is correct, uh, down to age of 25. And for smaller objects, uh, this is, I think, something that's under, uh, underappreciated. Uh, there are going to be uh, factors a few more, so an order of 250,000 down to age of 27 as they uh, perform, um, as they come closer to the Earth. Interstellar objects um, are, I think, one of the exciting areas of discovery that um, you know, we haven't thought about until two years ago, until the first one was found. Um, based on these two objects that are, that are visible, and again, the error bars are huge here, uh, we're likely to discover at least one detection per year in the LSST. 
And if, you're, um, uh, if you believe the more optimistic observations uh, or more optimistic predictions, it could go even as high as, as one per month. So it really depends on what the flux of these objects is. And the wonderful thing again about this is we will know the answer essentially in the first year. We will be able to, to set constraints. There are clearly synergies with space-based missions. Um, we're going to hear later um, from, from Colin Snodgrass on, on Comet Interceptor. Um, just looking at it statistically, um, LSST, given the number of objects that uh, it's a uh, good number of comets going to discover, is likely to be the one to find the Comet Interceptor target. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really, I think, interesting opportunity to have the ground-based mission um, enable um, uh, a lot of the decision-making for where to send uh, spacecrafts in a, and uh, to get them to perform research in the most effective way. And then there are clearly synergies with NASA's uh, planetary defense um, um, operations, such as the, the um, NEO surveillance mission. Um, NEO surveyor is expected to launch in 2025. And at that point, we will have both LSST on the ground and um, um, NEO surveyor in space looking at the infrared. Combining these two data sets is going to give us a fantastic um, um, data set, not just to discover uh, NEOs and potentially hazardous objects, but also to characterize them with both data in the optical and the infrared. The, I think overall, um, construction is going well other than the COVID um, um, impact. And the thing we're now starting to focus on is how to maximally enable science with Rubin. And both the facility and the operations of the facility are already funded. They're supported by the NSF and uh, the Department of Energy. But science investigations, um, unlike a typical NASA mission that uh, you know, comes with, with, with some funded key projects, here science investigations are to be competed entirely through usual grant calls, so the NASA SSO or NSF AAG. And given the scale of LSST, uh, what we're hearing from the community is that this makes it challenging to fund preparatory work because you know, LSST is going to dump orders of magnitude more data on, on all of us in just two years. There is some work to be put in to, to prepare software, to prepare um, you know, coordination, uh, to coordinate uh, follow-up and facilities. And when a, when a panel, let's say in a typical AAG call, is you know, faced with funding something where data exists and something that's going to be there two years from now, um, it will clearly uh, pick something where data exists. So this has been a challenge. And the, the reason why we worry about this is if the US community is not adequately prepared for Rubin data on day one, there's a chance that we're going to start missing rare discoveries. So I said, we're going to settle the question of ISOs in, in year one. Well, we will if we're able to, um, to do science on them. Um, or um, because the data are public, there's also a potential that um, the discoveries are, uh, are, are yielded or are led by international research teams that have um, a little bit more time and funding to prepare. So one of the things that we are thinking about, uh, especially the, the science collaboration led by Meg Schwamb is, are there ways to, to, that the funding agencies could, uh, uh, are there steps that the funding agencies could take to mitigate this issue? Perhaps addition of explicit review criteria, encouraging Kind of elements of, of preparatory work for LSSD proposals may be one option, but in some way to, um, to get the community to, uh, to a, a higher level of readiness uh, for, for LSSD data that are about to come. So this is where I'll stop and, and take questions. Um, the, uh, in this last summary slide, the thing I really want to point to is, is this underlined bit. We are a bit over two and a half years away from, from having this wonderful mission in the sky and orders of magnitude more solved to data. And I'm looking forward to that happening and us as a community really taking advantage of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mario, Mario for that update. Uh, you do have a question. Um, how much of the sky will not be covered? Any thoughts on that science, so, re oh, so regarding science and planetary defense? For example, would any of surveyor pick up all of the slack or only some? So, um, I, I, how much of the science will be covered depends on the exactly the, the final survey footprint. We typically, the typical numbers are in order 27,000 square degrees of the sky being covered. Um, so that leaves about you know, 10, 13,000 square degrees and basically, but, but roughly centered around uh, the, the northern um, 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 celestial pole. Right, just because of where the observatory is. We cover 
um, all of the ecliptic in a band of about 20 degrees. And you know, based on simulations, um, um, as, as long as an asteroid over the 10 over 10 year period kind of passes through that band, we're going to pick it up. And definitely, any odd objects that um, uh, that tend to avoid that region uh, will will be picked up uh, with with uh, any surveyor. Uh, 